Hey folks, this is Ben from Road to VR, and we're here at E3 2014 with the folks from Control VR. To my left is Alex, who is the CEO, and Ali, who is CTO, correct? Correct. Cool. So we just got a chance to check out the system. Kyle and myself uh, got in there and played on the moon and played in Tuscany, and I failed at attempting to throw some ping pong balls. Um, Alex, can you tell me, just give me the overview of the system. What is the full package going to look like? Of course, there's still stretch goals, which could change things, but um, assuming the Kickstarter goes as planned, what are our gamers expecting to get? Or, or are we still looking just at a developer kit? Sure. Well, currently what we're looking to provide the developers with is everything that they need, all the tools that they need to get working with Control VR and get their hands in the experience. So the development kit's going to include, depending on your pledge, uh, either one or the two full arm system, as well as an uh, SDK, which is going to provide you with an easy to use interface uh, such that you can get started working with Unity. Um, if you're doing gaming and also tie-ins, you know, if you're looking to work with uh, robotics or if you're looking to uh, come up with something new, we want to really provide you with the tools that you can do anything you want with your hands as it relates to computing systems. And Ali, can you give me a technical rundown of the system? How many IMUs are we talking about and exactly how, how does the system understand where your fingers are relative to your arms and everything else? Well, um, IMUs are inherently 3D OF systems. So you have to somehow have a structure. You have to have a structure that you can apply the information from the IMU to. So um, basically, we got the seven here, including the palm. So that's seven and seven is fourteen. We got one on the lower arm, one on the upper arm, and one on the chest to connect the two sides. And um, basically, uh, the concept of three DOF goes that it's three DOF until you have another segment connected to it then it becomes 6 DOF and the next one's 3 DOF. And so you keep going daisy chaining it all, all the way to there. And in our system, this is the anchor. But everything else is 6 DOF because if you have the structure correctly in, inputted, that every, and these guys are damn accurate. And so if you have your structure correct, the equipment will do the accurate part of applying the rotational data onto it. And so with a system like the DK2, which has a camera to get positional tracking of the headset, can you sync those two systems together? So if you know where the headset is, you'll have a more, you can have a, um, uh, not a relative, but an exact position. What do you want to? Is, that, yes. is that possible? Yes. Is that uh, something you're looking at? Uh, not only looking at, our systems were designed for it. So we are there waiting for people to make stuff for it. So um, one of those things is a camera. And it is hard for a big company like, Oculus, who's really into the, this um, role they're in, to ask them to cooperate with us. So it's much easier for us to put the camera in. So naturally, yes, we have a place and a time and a purpose for a camera. I actually, we discussed it in the Kickstarter video, how the hands get into place. To give a little aid, uh, optical aid, to inertial, to keep them honest. Yeah. And... So for systems like this that I've tried, where they're purely IMU based, uh, there's all, I, I haven't seen one that has the calibration perfect yet. Of course, many of them are, are not out as consumer products yet. But it feels like this thing where you can get 90% of the way there, but the company that will win is the one that gets the next 9%, so you can be 99% perfect with the accuracy. How confident are you that you're going to be able to get to a point where the fidelity is just is, is good enough that, um, that gamers are going to want it? Uh, can I... Uh... Uh, can I add to that, not disagree, but I think the key is the fingers. Uh -huh. Because uh, it's not so much calibration because you don't know if your thing is 90% or 80% or 100%. You're just playing with it until it disappoints you or you lose trust for the thing. I think what's changed the game with us is that we've allowed you to pick something up. That's something is the other systems haven't been able to do. They're too big. To pack all the technology into one IMU for them is just not possible. But for us it has been possible and we are the first out the gate. And I think that's what changed the difference. And I think that's what the key is. And as people give their support and the thing starts rolling, all those issues of that 80% to 90% to 100% will come out you know, without knowing it will all be resolved. And Alex, can you tell me kind of where the concept of the system came from? As I understand, you guys are kind of embedded in the, in the professional mocap world. What made you decide to come down and start playing in the consumer space? Sure. Well, we've been, you know, operating in the professional world now for uh, about two decades for Ollie and uh, and Jamie, who 
uh, has perfected the sensors for us. You know, what, what really brought us into this consumer space, I think for all of us, was a passion to get this out to more people because we know it's world-changing technology, we know it's the best thing out there. And so part of it was determining, you know, is it possible for us to get the price point down to a low enough point where we feel that people that currently would not be able to afford it on the high end would be able to start using it and working with it. So really the timing of the launch of VR and sort of the growth that we've experienced over the last year um, is uh, somewhat uh, something we weren't, planning on seeing, but you know, it makes sense according to the way we were looking at this market. So for us, it really comes from more of a place of wanting to see this technology out there and see it grow and affect the world in a positive way. And so gaming is clearly a great application of this technology and VR and being able to provide presence is a game changer. But we also know that there's a lot of applications that also don't involve VR that allow you to do world changing applications. So as I mentioned, robotics are looking at you know, virtual physical therapy and starting to get people working on things that are going to you know, affect the world uh, in a positive way and doing everything we can to support VR, the growth of VR, and give the full experience to the user. And we finally got to a point where we felt like we could get the prices down low enough that we would be able to start to seed uh, the market and start to understand what developers are looking for so that we can perfect this thing as we continue to scale it, get the prices even lower, uh, and move the industry forward. And now in the industry, of course, there are extremely expensive systems that are extremely accurate. Uh, that is generally because they have additional, uh, additional systems working for them. Let's say, you know, an entire ring of really high speed cameras, maybe IR markers and all that stuff. Is it just a matter of it being convenient to only be able to have a censored suit so you don't have to have a room dedicated to this? Or um, would, let's, let's say, is there a professional, could you spend $100,000 on a system that's just like Control VR and have it be more accurate? Or would you have to add more hardware, you know, that external stuff? Yeah, so even the most accurate optical systems, right, from some of the large companies out there that are $2 million and have 60 cameras in them, they still cannot capture the finger movements uh, of their actors. And it's something that we've been working towards for a long time. And the gloves that we are offering is actually a solution that they're going to embrace as well. Because if you sync what we have up with an optical system, that's how you really get the most precise um, actions and be able to get the data you're looking for. So it's actually kind of amazing that for a full system that's selling right now on Kickstarter as a, uh, a dev kit, um, you know, for under a thousand, well under a thousand dollars, that we're able to offer something that even the most expensive systems out there can't provide. I see it in 20 years. I see it like in, not 20, actually in 10 years, professional motion capture as we know it is be gone. To be all these people from their homes that actually little little indie people doing all the motion capture with their two thousand dollar mocap rig. So that actually leads me into a good question. Um, previously, the world of IMUs, basically before smartphones, and and still now to some extent, uh, there's these just crazy expensive IMUs that, as far as I know, don't do much better than what we have today. They're like you know five ten thousand dollars. What has happened in the industry in the last uh, few years that has brought them down to these prices? Or were they always that much and there was just a premium cost for them? I think what you've seen, like you had mentioned with cell phones, is just generally the, the growth of the IMU market in terms of manufacturers, right? So you have a lot of people out there who are starting to be able to produce in larger and larger amounts because of the demand. And with cell phones, you start having providers uh, and manufacturers out there that are creating so many of these at a time that they're able to get the prices down. So it's really just the natural progression of technology that the sensors and the technology that were in them that were so advanced five years ago, you're starting to see them being made by a lot of different companies and the price being driven down fully, you know? And the IMUs that we're using specifically are the best that you can possibly get on the planet. We're taking IMUs and really turbo boosting them to give them match, maximum eff efficacy and, you know, bringing them down into something that as small as they are. So, you know, I think we're going to continue to see the cost of those drop over time. Uh, and our hope at Control VR is that we can play a major part in seeing that happen uh, as we, you know, continue to grow the user base. And Ali, can you help me understand a little bit? So when I saw the first, when I saw the Kickstarter video, my first question was, uh, how are you doing 
how are you determining your exact position? What you've told me is that at the moment everything is, is relative actually. And so as long as you're interacting with all virtual things, then it, it shouldn't matter. Uh, but when you add the camera that you hope to, will that give you that, that exact position so that if you wanted to, say, interact with a physical steering wheel on your table, you could have that one-to-one -one matchup? Yeah, I've got an old saying that says the squeakiest wheel gets the oil. So now that we've given everybody this finger they've never had before, the next thing they want is, uh, I want my finger there, not there. So yeah, okay. That's easily solved with the camera, yes. That, the thing is, is actually a platform. So once you add the camera with what you have, you have a smorgasbord of stuff you can do with it. And one of the things you can do with it naturally is get those people who are worried about that issue relieved. Mm. Go on to the next squeeze wheel. Very good. Well, thank you both so much for your time. Yeah, thanks so much. And best of luck with the rest of your Kickstarter thanks and the rest nice of E3. Thanks, yeah, guys. Great.